parents brought you up as a whole person you mentioned they believed in the upbringing that was basically complete does that make sense uh absolutely yeah we um um I, was, I had an older brother and a younger sister, uh, and we did. Uh, we had responsibilities at home as we got older, um, and yeah, I would say that they did a very good job of putting all the pieces together. Because that's kept you from that's let you be uh, fulfill yourself for your entire life. So important. Now tell us about your little league where you were a star pitcher at 10 years of age, sort of begins there. Yeah, you might say I, I was uh, fortunate to uh, live in a house that was just one block away from a, a sports field, a park uh, there in San Luis Obispo. Um, and that's where we would, uh, we would go to. That's the, the days when your moms and dads would say, uh, go out and play and come back at dinner time. Um, and that's how our life started. Uh, the first organized Little League came to San Luis in 1950. So I was um, eight years old at the time. Uh, and that's when uh, the Little League Baseball started. And uh, the team that won the championship is sort of a start for you. Um, well, that was just fate. Uh, you know, and ironically, the name of the team was the, uh, uh, the Kiwanis Red Sox. Um, and after we won that championship, uh, our uh, coach wrote to the Red Sox and asked if the Red Sox would provide autographed pictures for all the members of the team. And they were kind enough to do that back in 1950. And I still have to this day an autographed picture from Mel Parnell of the Boston Red Sox. Uh, lo and behold, uh, not knowing that, um, what, <laughs> 15 years later, I would be on that very team. That's almost fate. In high school, you had a choice of basketball or uh, baseball. And the basketball player was seven feet tall and you couldn't <laughs> reach up. So basically you went into baseball and pitching was what you like to do. Can you tell us about that for a minute? Yes, I was um, uh, a very tall, uh, skinny guy. Um, being tall was very helpful in basketball. Um, and uh, when I uh, was accepted at Stanford University, uh, I actually went there to play basketball because um, I had, much better skills in that sport than I did in baseball at the time. Uh, but as you mentioned, there was a very tall gentleman by the name of Tom Dose, uh, who was ahead of me. Well, he wasn't ahead of me. We were equals, except that he was six foot 10 and I was six foot five. So um, I didn't play much as a freshman. And when the season was over, I looked at my chances of playing it, um, as a future basketball player for Stanford. Um, as slim and none. So I, uh, at that time, they had tryouts for the baseball team. I tried out for the freshman baseball team and, and made that team. And slowly but surely, my body uh, grew into the form that allowed me to be very successful. Stanford University scouted you and you got an academic scholarship. You wanna spend a minute what Stanford was like and what it meant to you? Well, it was, uh, it was, it turned out to be the best choice uh, that I could have made at the time. The other school that was, uh, I was looking at was University of California at Berkeley. Um, there were probably about um, 40,000 students there and at Stanford, there were only 8,000. Um, and I thought that I would, um, probably adapt much better in a smaller school atmosphere than I would have in a big school atmosphere. And uh, I mean, who knows, um, but I got a wonderful education uh, at Stanford University and uh, I'm very happy that I was able to carry on uh, with the skills that they gave me uh, that allowed me to get into Tufts Dental School later on. It was smart thinking. 
Tell us how you get on to the uh, Red Sox before well, you back in the, college. Yeah. Uh, in the summers, uh, back in the 60s, they had summer leagues very similar to what uh, happens down in Cape Cod. Um, they invite baseball players uh, down there to uh, improve their skills uh, and learn what uh, potential professional baseball can be like. I had an opportunity to play summer ball um, in 1962 in uh, Washington. And then the summer of 1963, I played in a league called the Basin League. Uh, we played out of winter South Dakota, um, as much of a heartland country area that you could ever, ever imagine. Um, and during the summer of 63, all of a sudden, that tall, lean, lanky form that was ready um, developed. And I had a wonderful summer. The Red Sox uh, uh, liked what they saw. The Orioles were the other team that were deeply interested in me, but the Red Sox made a better offer. So I signed for a huge fortune of um, $18,000, uh, which to me was a lot in those days. Wait one second. Go ahead. Sure. Hi. Hey, thank you. Okay, you got called up to the 1965 Red Sox team. Tell us about that team, which was uh, very poorly rated. Tell us about some of the people on it and how it started to evolve into 1967? Um, uh, I signed uh, actually with the Red Sox at the end of the summer of 1963. Uh, I went back to Stanford and took two more semesters of uh, classes. Uh, and I went to spring training um, in March of 1964. Um, I went to uh, the AAA farm team, uh, which at that time was Deland, Florida. And they, uh, because the competition that we had at Stanford was so high, uh, they placed me at a level where uh, they felt uh, that I, I could succeed. Um, but because I had no experience, um, they started me off uh, at Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, it was an A-ball uh, team. Uh, and the primary premise was to make sure that uh, your skills would uh, get better as would your confidence and your abilities. If you started too high and you failed, uh, it would set back a timetable that they had posed for uh, all young players. So I went to Winston-Salem. I was there for about nine weeks, eight weeks, and... Uh, did so well that they decided to promote me to the AAA team as opposed to the AA team. Again, they felt because of my experience in the, in the Pacific Coast uh, College League that I would be able to handle um, the um, more experienced players that I was going to be facing at the time. And so I finished out the summer in 64 uh, with Seattle. Uh, not a great year, but... Uh, I had some successes and uh, they, in, they invited me to camp uh, the spring of 1965, which happened to be at Scottsdale, Arizona uh, at the time. So everything went well. I stayed healthy. That's the biggest part about um, being in professional sports and especially uh, a pitcher uh, is making sure that your arm stays healthy. Um, I started with the team in 1965, uh, came to Boston out of spring training and, um, you know, things just started to progress year after year. And what was that uh, uh, team like, some of the people on it, the 65 team? Oh, uh, it was, you know, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I, I, I think they felt like it was a country club team that's what the, the press called uh, a lot of the players because of the way they uh, handle their lifestyles um, but I, I lockered next to a gentleman by the name of Earl Wilson uh, he was um, six foot five uh, 
just a magnificent human being that uh, African-American uh, was going to be the first player that the Red Sox had drafted uh, back in the 50s, but he uh, he got called in the military service. So it turned out that Pumpsy Green uh, became the first African-American that played for the Red Sox. Uh, but Earl became my mentor. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the good things that happened in the good things, and we talked about the bad things that happened in the bad games. Uh, but he was there to guide me through how to become a major league pitcher, how to become a, a mature adult, uh, how to take care of myself. Um, and I'll be forever great. Um, again, there was a lot of talent there, but it, nothing started to show up until 19, the, um, the second half of 1966. Uh, the Baltimore Orioles uh, went on to win uh, the championship that year. But as a team, from the All-Star break on, we had the second best record uh, in all of baseball. Um, we still ended up in ninth place, but that shows you how bad our, our first half was. It was horrible. But the team started to gel. Um, and I think the uh, uh, majority of us left the end of the season in 66, with a good feeling in our hearts uh, that we had, um, we had something going, uh, something special because we had played so well. And when you go home in the winter and you, you um, rehash all of the good games and the bad games, we had all the good games to remember. And that gives you a great feeling when you come into spring training the next year. And that's what happened. Uh, we got a new manager by the name of Dick Williams, uh, who brought a lot of discipline uh, to the team. And he brought all these talented ball players together. And um, again, uh, it was just step by step. Uh, it's an accomplishment, not only of the players' abilities, but it was an accomplishment also of Dick O'Connell, uh, our general manager, who put together some trades uh, to strengthen our team. And then the magic started to happen. We always like to think of ourselves as the spark that lit the fire for uh, Red Sox Nation. So um, that's what made 67 so special. And you mentioned you, you, you mentioned you came, is that you or me? Um, you mentioned uh, you came in the best shape you've been in. You've been to Venezuela, you've been skiing, you were in very good shape. Spend a moment on that. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, it was an interesting year. Uh, at the end of 66, uh, the ball club uh, had asked me to go down to Venezuela to uh, work on my breaking pitch. Uh, at the time, the uh, hitters were starting to key pretty much on my fastball and I I wasn't consistent with throwing the breaking ball for strikes. So they said, well, let's send you down to Venezuela for a couple of months. Um, and whenever the occasion arises, you throw that breaking ball. And I kept throwing it and throwing it and throwing it. And pretty soon I got a lot of confidence in it. I left Venezuela uh, just before Christmas. Um, went up skiing with some friends uh, in uh, Lake Tahoe at Heavenly Valley and loved it so much that I didn't have to go anywhere until February for another couple months. So I stayed up there and I skied all winter. And as it was, uh, the, uh, the skiing, uh, the work that you have to go through uh, uh, to be proficient at skiing, uh, the amount of falls that you take uh, while you're trying to learn how to ski uh, helps to develop your core strength, your, your thighs, uh, your back, your shoulders. Uh, so I actually left. Um, Heavenly Valley on a Friday, uh, Friday morning and got to spring training, um, as I mentioned earlier, in the best shape I'd ever been in. What about your uh, duel with the uh, batter as a pitcher and home plate and the catcher? Can you spend a moment on that? Sure. Uh, uh, along with Dick Williams, uh, as our new manager, he brought along a gentleman uh, by the name of Sal Magley. Uh, Sal Magley was a, a very uh, successful pitcher for the New York Giants. Uh, 
he also had a nickname. Uh, his nickname was the barber. Uh, and the reason why they call him the barber is because he never liked hitters to get too comfortable at home plate. Um, and the way he would do that is that he would throw um, a lot of pitches inside off the plate that could possibly hit the batter if he didn't uh, um, get out of the way. So uh, it was a, a subtle form of intimidation, but Sal spent a lot of time talking to me about the fact that hitters were starting to look for pitches uh, away from me. And we had to make sure that they couldn't have control over both sides of the plate. They couldn't own the inside and the outside at the same time. They had to relinquish one of those uh, to the pitcher, um, that being me. Along with learning how to pitch inside, he also taught me a uh, four seam fastball, which has a tendency to go through the air with a little more resistance. Um, and the more resistance there is as the baseball goes through the air, the straighter it goes. And that allowed me to learn how to pitch to the outside corner of the plate. Uh, so with a combination of being able to pitch outside and to pitch inside, I now had options that hitters weren't prepared for. Okay, tell me about the All-Star game. The All-Star game. The uh, 67 uh, Red Sox. Yeah, that was, uh, that was out in Anaheim, California. Uh, it was a great honor uh, for me to be part of that team. Uh, obviously, I had uh, pitched very well, but I pitched very well because I had a wonderful team behind me. Um, I pitched on the Sunday afternoon before the All-Star game. Uh, I beat the Tigers, uh, I think it was two to one, uh, went nine innings uh, through 135 pitches. Uh, so there was no way that I was ever going to be able to warm up for a game two days later and uh, pitch in the All-Star game. So I was a, a spectator, uh, Charles. Um, I just sat in the bullpen and watched the American League. Uh, I think we played 16 innings that game. <laughs> um, and I just watched, but it was still such a great honor to be part of the American League All-Star team at that time. Okay, uh, tell us about the Cy Young Award. Well, that was, um, that was a, like frosting on the cake. You know, we, um, uh, we ended up winning the, the pennant in 67, um, you know, going on to face the Cardinals in the, in the World Series, uh, you know, that was not, uh, it was almost anticlimactic for us to, to be in the World Series because we had felt so good about even winning the, uh, the American League pennant uh, that it was like, you know, icing on the cake. Uh, now we can just go on and, and have a good time with no expectations that we were gonna be able to beat them. But, um, the Cy Young Award came in November of that year. Uh, there were two or three other pitchers that were very uh, closely involved in the tabulation, but it, I think the fact that you know we ended up winning the American League pennant, and I ended up tying for the most victories and had the most strikeouts, uh, that kind of influenced uh, the way the vote went, and so I I got to bring the award home. It was sitting in my office right now. Tell us about the um, dedication of the statue uh, on the Northeastern campus for the Cy Young Award. Well, that was, uh, that was a kind of a unique uh, historical um, moment for, um, for Northeastern. Um, the old ballpark in Boston used to be on the grounds where Northeastern is right now. And they actually had uh, plans uh, of where the original home plate was. Um, and so they wanted to commemorate the fact that Northeastern had, <coughs> excuse me, had some part in uh, Red Sox history. And uh, they decided to put a, a picture of Cy Young, and not a picture, a big statue of Cy Young. And I have a, a copy, a small copy of it here in my office. Um, and so they, it, it turned out that I was the first Red, uh, first Red Sox 
player to ever win the Cy Young Award. And it was just all kind of, again, as you mentioned earlier, fate um, that uh, they would put a statue up there and I got to be there for the uh, opening ceremony. Because right next to where that gymnasium is in the area that statue must be is where Tufts Dental began as a, uh, as, uh, as a dental college in 1900. The uh, park next door is where, where uh, uh, they played, the Red Sox played, that's 1901. In other words, all of this comes together in a strange way, blinking as I see it, at least physically, Tufts Dental, Tufts Medical, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, Red Sox baseball, and you are the link. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small world, Charles. Oh, you, you bet. Uh, can you spend a minute on your Stremski, Canigliaro? Those are all special people on that team of 67. Oh, my gosh. They're, uh, they are uh, among a group of uh, very special individuals. But obviously, Yaz had uh, won the Triple Crown that year. Um, you know, most home runs, uh, best batting average, and the most, and the most RBIs. Uh, he tied with home runs with Harmon Killer Group, but he still was uh, a triple crown winner. And um, he not only did it at the plate, but uh, he also did it in the field with his fielding, uh, making spectacular catches. Uh, he did it with his base running. Uh, there were some times when he was a little, uh, what would you say, too adventurous uh, with regard to taking an extra base, but um, in the end, it was uh, the way he played baseball. And one of the things that he attributes it to, and I would uh, totally agree with him, was that he was the first uh, baseball player that worked out in the winter. Uh, he hired Gene Birdie, um, who was a physical fitness trainer up in uh, Linfield, uh, Colonial. And he worked out all winter to get ready for spring training. Um, Historically, baseball players at the end of the season would take their glove, uh, take their jock strap, <laughs> um, take their shoes, put them in the box, put the box in a closet and not open that closet door for three more months and go to spring training and use spring training to get into shape. Uh, but Yaz was the first guy that really provided uh, the impetus for all baseball players to work out in the off season uh, and come into spring training in shape. And it definitely showed with his, uh, his performance in that year. Uh, with regard to Tony C, he was a, uh, uh, for the uh, younger people, Tony Canigliaro was a, a Swamp Scott uh, native and uh, uh, came to uh, uh, Finley, I think in 60, I think it was maybe, uh, 65 uh, when I came up, but um, he was having a fantastic year. He, uh, between he and Carl, there were uh, either one of them, uh, they came up to the plate with a situation uh, where you wanted somebody to drive in a run, you would want Tony up there or you would want Carl up there. Um, but Tony paid a price. Uh, one of the reasons why he was such a, an aggressive hitter is that he, he waited until the last moment to swing at the pitch. Um, and that put him in harm's way if that pitch happened to get away from the pitcher. And that happened on a particular night uh, uh, against the Angels when a pitcher by the name of Jack Hamilton um, let go of a pitch that got away from him and it hit Tony, um, I'm trying to think, hit Tony right here, uh, fractured his orbital bones. Uh, and put him out for the rest of the season. Um, but he came back uh, a couple of years later to be uh, fairly successful. And, uh, and then all of a sudden the eye just wouldn't work anymore. So, but it just, uh, again, it was part of, um, just part of a wonderful team with so many great memories and so many great people. Telling them about Rico Petroselli's last catch of the game. And why uh, that? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, no, that was uh, great. Uh, uh, one of the things that 
that happened during the course of my uh, previous years with the Red Sox is that in, um, we got called into active duty. Um, doc, uh, Dick O'Connell, the general manager, knew that we had a very bad draft numbers in 65. So at the end of the season, um, we signed up for um, a, a program called Six and Six. It was six months of active duty and six uh, years of um, uh, reserve duty. And Rico and I actually went to spring training together in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, uh, the fall of 1965, to complete uh, the initial stage of that, uh, that requirement, uh, the act duty part. And so we got to be very good friends. Uh, um, when you're in basic training, uh, you, you need friends because it's a pretty, it can be a pretty, uh, pretty difficult, uh, time in your life with regard to changing all of your habits and your disciplines to become part of, uh, of the armed services. Uh, but yeah, so it turns out that Rico, a guy by the name of Rich Rollins, uh, uh, hits a little pop-up uh, uh, short left field and Rico uh, drops back and catches uh, the ball. Um, I have a favorite picture here, in my office uh, that shows um, it's a shot of me jumping up on the mound with my arms straight up and Rico with the ball in his glove and Yaz in left field with his arms straight up in the air. Uh, and it was that moment that, uh, you know, clinched the, well, it, it wasn't that moment that clinched the day, but it was uh, the moment when we at least had won our game because we had to wait to see what happened in Detroit after that. Is this the ball? Yeah you brought into uh, Mr. Yaki? Yes, it was. Uh, Rico was very, uh, uh, what would you say? Uh, he knew the significance of this baseball and he kept it. Uh, he gave it to me after the game. Uh, uh, he, he felt that I was deserving of it. And during the course of celebrating afterwards and stuff, and you know, you, you have moments uh, when, um, a thought goes through your head. And at that particular time, I said, you know, there's one guy that's probably been waiting for this baseball uh, a lot longer than I have. And that would be our owner, uh, Mr. Tom Yaki. And so I, um, I got permission to walk up the stairs uh, and meet with him and present him the game ball from, from that particular game. And that was, that was a great thrill. Tell me about his contribution to the Jimmy Fund. Oh my gosh, uh, you can you can drive anywhere. I think in in Boston, uh, around um, you know the majority of your medical um, <clears throat> centers, uh, and see Mr. Yaki and Mrs. Yaki's uh, name uh, on a building somewhere in a clinic somewhere. Uh, uh, the Jimmy Fund was um, the Red Sox uh, um, choice with regard to charitable uh, contributions. When you walked into the clubhouse, when I walked into the clubhouse in 1965, uh, up on the wall, the first thing you would see would be uh, contribute to the Jimmy Fund. It was a little boy walking um, down the street uh, with his ha hand held by uh, what obviously was a doctor. And so from the moment you walk into Red Sox life, you go hand in hand with the Jimmy Fund. And that's where the Yaki's felt like they could help the most with regard to healthcare in our, in our wonderful city. Now, Mike Andrews was on the 67 uh, team. He became the executive director of the Jimmy Fund for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Yes. Want, to, want to mention him for a minute? Oh, my gosh. Mike, uh, uh, the executive director, when I was there in 65, was a guy by the name of Bill Coster. Uh, uh, I actually um, uh, got to know him very well. And then Ken Coleman became the executive director. And then when Ken stepped down, Mike stepped in. Um, and what a, a great job he did. He had the same commitment that, um, that all of his predecessors has, uh, and yet he had the, 
um, the history of actually being a Red Sox player. Uh, he still lived up in uh, uh, north of Boston. Uh, so uh, he was able to not only keep the Red Sox uh, alive, uh, their, their spirit alive in the Jimmy Fund, but he was hands-on uh, with, uh, with the Jimmy Fund. And uh, I spent a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of time with him at different events during the course of the years. Okay, the seventh game of the World Series, the Red Sox don't win it, but yet you've been able to put it together uh, psychologically that it is a win, although it isn't. You want to explain that a bit? Because it's so <laughs> unique, yeah. Yeah, it, it is. And it, it, it kind of goes to the fact that uh, something that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the, we were so happy that we were able to um, come against the greatest odds um, uh, that the sports world uh, could put against you to come from ninth place and then to then, uh, you know, become the champions and to, to do it on the last day of the season. Uh, that made it even more special. So that uh, we come into the World Series, we lose the first game to uh, Mr. Bob Gibson. Uh, I win the second game. Uh, they win the third game. Uh, let's see, one, two. They win the third game and the fourth game. Uh, I go to St. Louis. Uh, I win that game. Um, they come back to Boston. Um, we win game six. Uh, Gary Wasilewski pitches a, a, a really great game. And so it comes down to the final um, best out of seven. And it's Gibson uh, uh, against me. Um, and he was, uh, we took him to seven games. And that's what I think all of us felt remarkable, uh, remarkable in that feat is that nobody gave us a chance. They never gave us a chance to win uh, the pennant and they never gave us a chance to, excuse me, win the World Series. So just the fact that we took them to seven games made us feel really good about everything that we had accomplished that time. You released from the Red Sox a few years later to the Milwaukee Brewers and then to the Philadelphia Phillies well, you had three of your very best years in the National League, and then you were released. Now, you're going on to a second career. Your wife, us, what do we do? And she suggests, since you wanted to be an orthopedic surgery, since you took pre-medical in Stanford, why not try dentistry? You want to spend a minute on that special moment? Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty unique. Um, we had uh, when we left Philadelphia um, in the spring or the summer of '79. Uh, we had five children at the time. Uh, baseball was obviously over, um, but I had to start thinking about getting a job because we didn't make the kind of money in those days that uh, baseball players do today. Um, if someone would have played 15 years uh, of baseball, um, by today's standards, they would not have uh, thought about uh, trying to go get another job. Um, so during the course of that conversation, she just said, well, why don't you become a dentist? You know, said, you always look good in a uniform and you've always liked being in the healthcare field. And the more we talked about it, the the more it, it seemed like a possibility. And, and that particular night, we were in our condominium up at uh, Stratton, Vermont. And um, I called up Bill Lenkaitis, uh, a center for the New England Patriots who had become a dentist uh, while he was playing football. And he gave me great um, input with regard to the possibilities of doing it, the joys of dentistry. I called up uh, Ralph Sozio, uh, who was just a, a, a good friend because we kind of traveled in the same social circles uh, uh, in Boston. Uh, I called up uh, uh, Dr. Bob Stein um, and got nothing but uh, encouragement to follow through with this. And so I came back, came back the next week and talked to the folks at Tufts Admissions and they gave me advice and um, 
I took the DATs, which I did not do well on, <laughs> but they said that my grades went at Stanford, which weren't so good, uh, had become inflated through time and experience. Uh, uh, they felt like that they were, they weren't B's and C's, they were now A's and B's. So that all fell into place. Um, and I was accepted to Tufts. They recommended that I go to learn how to study again. So I went to the UMass uh, Boston campus for a year and um, was able to develop study skills and get back into some scientific uh, um, teachings that made it a lot easier once I got, uh, got into the Tufts program. Okay. Uh, you want to tell us how you learned to study at Tufts at uh, five in the morning? That's an interesting story. school. Yeah, you know, I was uh, trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to do this? Uh, I would come home uh, from uh, classes and sit down and uh, help Rosie with the kids and sit down and have dinner and little Johnny would be falling asleep and I'd be falling asleep and then I'd wake up and put the kids down and I'd go try to study uh, and I'd end up falling asleep, not retaining any information. Uh, so one morning I decided that I, um, I think I'll just, I'll get up at five o'clock in the morning, I'll drive into Boston, um, get into the, um, uh, the building uh, and find a room and start studying. Um, I met um, one of the janitors there by the name of Chicky. Um, he knew who I was and what I was uh, trying to do. And he actually got me a private room with a key. Uh, um, and it allowed me to now start studying. I'd go to bed when the kids go to bed. They went to bed at seven o'clock. I went to bed at seven o'clock. But you wake up at five in the morning, you've got a good night's sleep. Um, the traffic going into town was nothing. So um, it proved to be a, a real deal breaker because it allowed me to study with a fresh, clear mind as opposed to studying with a mind that was exhausted. And uh, it worked out very well. Okay, some of the lifelong friends you made in anatomy. Bree Clinton, you want to spend a moment on how the bonding took place? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, anatomy um, was a very, very uh, cool course. <laughs> to think that um, we were actually uh, learning about the human body, um, you know, through that course. Uh, I remember they told us that uh, we got the, uh, we got the right side of the cadaver and the med students uh, would study these uh, these uh, people. Um, they get the left side, and and we got the head and neck. Um, but you have a lot of conversations over a long period of time because to learn ab about what makes the human body uh, work the way it does and makes it so special is that you have to really pay attention and have conversations, and these conversations led to friendships. Uh, which today, uh, Steve Kerr, uh, Joy O'Keefe, uh, you know, we have uh, continued to be really, really good friends. Uh, and it all started uh, over a course of an anat uh, anatomy. What about preclinical? Pre yeah, again, uh, uh, again, it turns out that uh, in preclin, the, the uh, one row that we're in, we had a gentleman by the name of Rich Neal, uh, who is, uh, continues to be a, a, a good friend. There was Joy O'Keefe, uh, myself, and Steve Kerr. <laughs> if I were to tell you now that between us, there are probably about uh, 20 children. <laughs> I don't know if there was something, <laughs> something in the air around that particular row, but Rich had four kids. Joy had uh, four, Steve had five, uh, I ended up having six. So um, it was a very, very fertile, fertile row, you might say. <laughs> um, and that just made life so much fun. Uh, they were uh, all a little bit older um, than the normal kids. Uh, I was the oldest one in the course, actually at 37. So 
um, it was just nice to know that because of those relationships that we still continue to have friendships uh, into this day. In the clinic, how did your age and experience at having lived help you as a clinician? Oh, that's a uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think um, the fact that my life experiences, uh, with all the traveling that uh, I'd done, uh, with all the baseball that I had played, uh, with all the time with uh, our kids. Uh, um, and my wife, um, th that provides you with uh, what do you call a conversation currency? Uh, so that if I'm uh, most of the uh, patients that we saw in the clinic were older, um, so they looked at this guy that was 37, 38 years old uh, with life experience, and uh, you know I think they were able to be more at ease with whatever I was trying to explain to them or provide for them uh, something that maybe somebody that was 21 years old uh, couldn't um, um, pass on that kind of information with the same confidence that I was able to pass it on. So it definitely was an advantage for me, uh, not only in the, uh, uh, in the clinical part of our education, but also uh, in my private practice as uh, you start to develop a patient base. Uh, patients look at you as an older person, uh, assuming that you know more than someone who might be 22 years old or whatever. What about uh, mentorship at the dental school? Who, beside, who was very good at it for you? Well, at, at Tufts, I don't know if they still have it, but they uh, they always placed uh, the freshman um, uh, with an upperclassman, generally a senior. Um, uh, we actually, uh, Charles, were the last of the three-year classes uh, that were offered at Tufts Dental School. Uh, the federal government, uh, I think 10 years prior, had figured out that there weren't going to be enough dentists out there. So they asked a few schools around the country to uh, develop a three-year program instead of a four-year program, figuring that they could get more dentists out into the, uh, the general population. Uh, so we happened to be the last of the three-year classes. We went through classes all summer long, um, no breaks. Uh, and so I had a senior mentor by the name of Paul Bacciarelli, who was, uh, uh, went on to become an oral surgeon. Uh, he's down in Rhode Island, I think, or Connecticut. Um, uh, and then Van Zissi uh, was also very, very important in my life because he was one of those uh, guys that hung out with Ralph Sozio and Bob Stein. And uh, so there, there was something, um, some, uh, what do you call, extracurricular friendships that made um, our, relation, our relationship special uh, because he took a special interest in me. Um, and in fact, I, I didn't even tell you this earlier, but uh, my wife, Rosemary, uh, who I did not know uh, at the time, actually saw Van Zissi in his office in, 19, in 1970, 1969 for a dental appointment, <laughs> little knowing that she would become my wife <laughs> two years later. Uh, another small, interesting coincidence. You liked Crown and Bridge uh, in the clinic, preparing the preparation meant a lot to you. Why? Um, I don't know, it's just very interesting. Uh, my father was a professor of agriculture at Cal Poly in uh, San Luis Obispo. And so I spent a lot of time um, in the fields with him. And it, it kind of reminded me of what it was like to prepare the soil, um, to um, nurture the soil, to uh, plant seeds, and then to see your crops come up uh, from all of that hard work. And that's what was cool about Crown and Bridge is that you had to prepare the site, uh, you had to <clears throat> take the impressions, uh, you had to uh, design the crown and then 
put it on the tooth and it was very rewarding. Uh, um, and then I got to uh, meet uh, Dr. Stein, uh, who was just uh, a, a hero, uh, I think, among a lot of people that who are in the prosthodontic world uh, because of his innovations. Uh, and he instilled uh, great skills in, uh, into my personal knowledge. OK. Um, you worked in his office a couple of days a week after you graduated and in another office, and then eventually you opened your own. But uh, you mentioned what you learned there working in the lab in your spare time. Can you spend a moment? Yeah, I well, mean, Bob, Bob, was, uh, Bob was a hands-on uh, uh, clinician. I mean, not only did he you know, do incredible work, but he also was in the lab with uh, his technician, Maureen, and uh, he'd actually do uh, a lot of the lab work himself because he enjoyed it, number one. But he also was able to pass on all those skills to anybody that came in touch uh, with him because he just loved the whole aspect from beginning to end. Um, so for me to, to be there and understand the, uh, the shapes of things and why, you know, how you could kind of fudge in some places, but his uh, mechanical preparations uh, were so uh, special and so unique uh, that he could have a, a stub of a tooth, but he could prepare it in such a way that it would retain a, a crown. And those are the things that uh, that final margin that you're trying to prepare on that tooth to hold that crown uh, on that tooth uh, under the greatest amount of stresses in people's uh, eating habits so for all of those years uh, just made him like a magician to me. And I was uh, hopefully able to carry on those skills uh, you know, for the next 34 years. Tell us about opening your own office. What was that like? And where the place you chose? You know, that was uh, for the first two years, I, I worked with uh, Dr. Joel Leonard in Nor Norwell. Uh, he was uh, very helpful uh, to provide me a space uh, and then with Dr. Stein. But uh, I, re re I realized that I didn't go into dental school to spend three hours a day driving from Situate to Boston, uh, Boston back to Situate. Uh, I felt it was time to uh, find a, a, an area where I could built my own practice. Uh, I looked first in Marshfield, um, but then we settled on a place in Hanover, Mass. Um, it was just a small, small office. I only had two chairs, uh, one for myself and one for a hygienist. I had plans uh, set up for a third chair in case it might become uh, necessary in years to come, but I just kept it small. Um, I had an office manager, uh, I had an assistant for a couple of years um, and then she decided to get married and uh, go up to Maine. And I didn't want to train another one. So I just, I said, I've got long arms. I can reach everything I need to reach. And <laughs> so I just, uh, I went solo as a practitioner, uh, but I did have a hygienist uh, chair and, um, and I was 10 minutes uh, from my home. So I spent the next 34 years uh, developing that practice and uh, it, it took a while, six days a week, uh, but it was worth it uh, because um, uh, it provided me a lot of joy and satisfaction. And would you recommend solo practice again? You know, it depends on the individual. I, <laughs> I, think, um, I, I think some uh, people, uh, might be able to have the mental skills to handle lots of different people in the office. Uh, I felt that my life would be happier if I didn't have to worry about a lot of people. Um, uh, and that's why I decided to, to stay solo. Okay, you sold the practice to a gentleman who uses CEREC. <laughs> you did cast crowns. Did you see a difference? Um, you know, 
Uh, that's a hard question to answer because I, um, I know it had it became a very, very popular uh, and still is to this day, uh, a way of fabricating crowns, but I'm, I actually never saw um, the crowns go uh, onto the teeth uh, of, uh, of Dr. Kalka. So I never actually was able to uh, run an explorer over and see what the margins were like and stuff like that. So I, I could not uh, honestly answer that question, but in the lab, uh, they look like um, you know very workable, uh, uh, functional uh, crowns. So, you know, I think they've been very, very successful over the years. Okay, um, the skills you carry over, I think we mentioned them anyway, from baseball to dentistry. You know how to handle stress. You know how to assess what's in front of you. Can you spend a moment on that? Well, they are very uh, similar in many, many ways. Um, you know, <clears throat> number one, you have to get a good night's sleep <laughs> the night before you pitch. You, you should do that when you're working in, in the dental office. Uh, you need to take care of yourself and, self and be healthy. Um, preparation for pitching a baseball game, going over the hitters. Uh, same thing uh, with preparation and treating patients. Uh, going over, um, you know, whatever the case is. Uh, um, being able to recognize when something goes wrong, uh, say you have a bad inning, how to get out of that bad inning. When uh, something goes wrong uh, with a procedure, you know, how to keep your cool, uh, you know, use your mental skills and uh, provide, uh, you know, the necessary, um, uh, what can I say, the uh, treatments to make sure that everything's going to turn out to be 100%. Um, in baseball, if you lose a game, uh, you just get ready for your next game. Um, in dentistry, you don't lose games. Uh, <laughs> you can't lose games. You have, to, uh, you have to follow through and make sure it's done right. Um, and then you can move on uh, to the next patient. Okay, in uh, 2017, you had the 50 year celebration of the impossible dream. You wanna just spend a minute on who came back, what it was like? Well, um, uh, no, I, <laughs> it, was a, it was a special day. They, they uh, celebrated out on the field at Fenway Park. And um, you know, I can't tell you <clears throat> everybody who came back. Uh, I know that some, uh, some have passed away and that was uh, just a sad part of life. But the fact that we were all there to celebrate what we, what we had all accomplished, uh, those that were present and those that weren't present. Um, was very meaningful uh, for us because it reiterated uh, the hard work that we had put through that whole summer. Uh, it reiterated uh, the hard work that the managers and general managers had put together. Um, it reiterated what uh, each individual on that team meant to that team because everybody did contribute uh, to that fantastic season. Uh, so that was the joy of, uh, of the celebration. Uh, just um, remembering that we had done something special that year. Okay, I'm gonna complete this with a uh, quote from you that was published in the uh, ADA News in 2017 by uh, Kelly Soderlund, you probably forgot, but, and here's, here it goes, 50 years after, the thing I loved the most about dentistry was being able to incorporate the science and the engineering of clinical work into the healthcare setting. That provided compassionate treatment for all my patients. I looked forward to going to work every day. It was like being a startup pitcher every day and going to the ballpark. Would, would that summarize Jim Lomborg? It's a beautiful oh, boy. I said that, huh? <laughs> yeah, my quarter. Uh, yeah. 
That's in the ADA news, yeah. Well, it sounds like a very happy human being. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's fulfilled. You're fulfilled. I mean, that's it, quite rare. Yeah, you know, I, and to this day, uh, I thank um, everybody who was involved in guiding me uh, on this wonderful journey. Uh, you know, um, not only in life, but uh, especially in dentistry, because um, I, I can't think of a better way to spend 34 years of your life uh, and to come home and luckily to be healthy uh, and to know that uh, I, I was able to, to get my fingers dirty <laughs> for all those years and, uh, and um, and provide a great service for people. So that was, it was very special for me. Thank you, Charles. So thank you. And um, I hope to see you again. And uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> thank All you. All right. Ah, thanks, Charles. Thank you.